Good morning, friends. Uh, um, this is CEC EduSat Network, and uh, <coughs> we are having a lecture series uh, under which uh, today's lecture has been organized. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Payal Nagpal from Delhi University, and uh, the lecture series uh, is titled Indian Writing in English. And she'll be talking today uh, on uh, Sarojini Naidu's prose works. So, Dr. Payal Nagpal, uh, welcome to you. And uh, may I uh, tell you that uh, I generally didn't know that uh, Sarojini Naidu also wrote prose. I thought she was basically a poet, uh, but uh, as this lecture is organized, we are aware that she also wrote prose works and she was a person of thought. So please tell us something about her uh, and uh, the prose works and their quality and their content, their themes to begin with. And please, please begin. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Prakash. Um, <laughs> I think, uh, uh, so when we uh, discuss Sarojini Naidu in terms of her prose works and uh, of course uh, the speeches that she gave on various occasions. Um, today's uh, lecture is especially uh, going to keep in mind I think a question that was raised uh, in a previous lecture uh, by Dr. Prakash regarding uh, the use of uh, a poetic sensibility and the use of imagination and we can uh, trace how this is equally there in her prose writings and her speeches. So, uh, uh, again, uh, to uh, uh, give a uh, very quick, uh, you know, update on uh, the years uh, to which Sarojini Naidu belongs. So, the dates are 1879 to 1949. She was born in 1879 and lived up to 1949. So, as a young woman, of course, uh, she must have seen uh, the following uh, changes. Uh, uh, one, of course, the transition from the late 19th century reform period to the early 20th century. Um, and then secondly, the struggle for independence. Uh, and the third, uh, of course, as she uh, lives right up to 1949, uh, she uh, gets to see India uh, uh, as a free nation and a very, very vibrant democracy. Uh, so in this sense, she is also uh, part of a group that helps in the formation of uh, ideals in India. Uh, you know, in the sense that uh, when the struggle for independence is on, uh, the whole question about uh, uh, what kind of, uh, of uh, exercise should nation building be about is something that uh, she engages in uh, with very, very uh, deeply. So, uh, and in both uh, poetry and her uh, prose writings, she is able to weave together uh, the physical uh, landscape of India with the ideals of nationalism on the imaginative plane. So, as I said, this uh, takes me back to uh, one of the questions uh, that Dr. Prakash had put up uh, in, in the previous lecture regarding um, the issue of, uh, you know, uh, the poetic sensibility and the way it figures in her uh, prose writings. And uh, it, it is quite there. It is absolutely there. And uh, uh, we, we see the poetic sensibility, the poetic persona there in her uh, prose writings and in her uh, speeches as well. Um, so, uh, she had written her first poem, Meher Munir, at the age of 13, and her poetry collection, The Golden Threshold, is published. That's the first poetry collection is published by 1905. And uh, somewhere at the turn of the century, uh, you know, around 1902, 1903, she becomes very, very active in public life. So, uh, not just, uh, you know, it's not as if she's devoted only to writing or only to an active public life, but both uh, uh, parts of, uh, you know, uh, her uh, uh, persona are very well uh, expressed and kept together. So, uh, uh, in 1906, uh, she addresses the Indian Social uh, Conference in Calcutta, which is on the education of women. And from this time onwards, she continues to speak in public fora for the equality of women, religious unity and harmony. And of course, uh, you know, uh, as she is uh, greatly influenced uh, 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 by both Gokhale and uh, Mahatma Gandhi, she uh, at a certain point in time starts explaining the ideas of uh, Mahatma Gandhi and of course uh, the ideals of uh, nationalism, the ideals that are important uh, to gain freedom, she starts explaining these ideas and the, the, her reach in that sense is 
uh, very very uh, wide. So in 1920, if we, if we were to just uh, do a very very quick uh, chronological update and see <coughs> some of the important aspects, uh, you know, that that uh, span her life. So in 1925, she is the first woman who becomes the president of the Indian National Congress. In 1927, she helps in setting up of the All India Women's Conference. And in 1930, she becomes the president of the All India Women's Conference. She is also arrested and sent to jail in 1931. Um, in 1932, uh, she becomes the acting president of uh, the Congress. And uh, in 1933, she helps in setting up of the Lady Irvin College. Uh, she is part of uh, you know, the numerous satyagrahas that are organized by uh, Mahatma Gandhi. So what we see here is that uh, you know, matrimony and four children, all this did not prevent uh, you know, or uh, you know, in any way stop this uh, very, very active woman uh, not only from writing a poetry, but from becoming a very, very active part uh, of, uh, you know, uh, the, the struggle for freedom. So, um, and uh, her imagination is something that plays a very dynamic role in both uh, her uh, um, published poetry as well as uh, her active participation in the ideals of nation building. Uh, in, in, in this sense, uh, you know, um, she can be seen as an intellectual, as an organic intellectual who explains the ideas of the new forces uh, in India and these of course are the forces of uh, democracy. So some of the primary concerns in her uh, essays and her uh, uh, speeches are, uh, you know, uh, the uh, concerns are primary, uh, primarily <coughs> about women, their education and the franchise. So uh, the, this, uh, another important uh, issue that she focuses on is religious unity and a secular voice. So uh, and of course uh, the, the stress on uh, the spiritual and the philosophical is also there. Um, I think here uh, uh, I'd, I'd uh, like to uh, you know discuss uh, with uh, the course coordinator, Dr. Prakash, about her role as uh, an organic intellectual, where uh, her participation in the struggle for freedom allows us uh, to actually uh, uh, you know uh, 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 slot uh, Sarojini Naidu in 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 the group where we have people who uh, contributed in a very big way. Uh, to the struggle for freedom. Uh, Dr. Paranagpal, what you know draws my attention uh, to her role as, as an intellectual, and you use the word organic intellectual, uh, is you know the uh, women's education, you know, which is the need of the hour. Women are not uh, going at that time to the school, and uh, nobody knows what kind of education should be given <coughs> to them. And the second thing is India's freedom. So, do you think some kind of a connect between uh, you know women's education and India's freedom from, from her point of view? Yes, uh, there is certainly a, a very, very deep connect. So much so that she says that, uh, you know, the, in one of her speeches, she, she says that uh, the, the hand that, uh, the power that rocks the cradle is the power that uh, rules the world. Mm -hmm. And she says that this whole exercise of nation building is going to be successful only if women are an active part of this process. Uh, otherwise else, uh, this, is, uh, this cannot be realized. So she very actively, uh, you know, uh, talks to people in her public addresses, her speeches that it is uh, the education of women is uh, extremely important uh, as a factor. So uh, one of the concerns that act she actually begins with, uh, you know, is is that of youth, and uh, she ad her address to the youth is very very important. And uh, in a in a public meeting at Pachayapas College, uh, Madras, in 1903, uh, she addresses the youth uh, from time to time, and she speaks in this very very straightforward, honest manner. And sh uh, she tries to show them the way. She shares doubts. She shares her own experiences, and talks about uh, what she calls the provincial nature of the youth, focusing on their own region, their caste, community, or religion. And she says that the counter to this is genuine brotherhood. And she says that you, you have to give up that uh, uh, attitude of uh, being provincial and you have that the only way that you can counter that is through brotherhood. Uh, she lays a lot of stress on uh, the real life dialogue between people uh, in comparison to knowledge or information that is acquired through books. She, she tells the, in, and this is uh, an address to young people, she says that um, you know, you, uh, it's all right. You might have read Shelley on uh, Shelley's on liberty, or you might have read Keats uh, on the Brotherhood of Man. Uh, but uh, but uh, Sarojini Naidu says she says that that knowledge is there. You need that. But what is more important 
is the interaction that you will have with other people so she says you must travel you must move out and you must interact with more and more people now this is a, this acquires this kind of an attitude acquires great significance when we uh, put it in the context of the struggle for freedom and it it, it is a message that also allows uh, people to get together and uh, to be unified what exactly is the provincial nature at that time and how she sees it as a threat as a kind of limitation that people have to come out of Right. Uh, if, if you could like, uh, yes. throw some light on this. Yes. Uh, the, I think when she says provincial nature of the youth, she says that you know the fact that you think that you belong to a particular region mm -hmm. or a particular caste or a particular community or religion. She says that is the provincial attitude where you think about yourself as belonging to only a particular uh, uh, zone. Uh, that needs to be given up and for this she gives her own example mm -hmm. and uh, I quote her here that she says in a Mohammedan city I was brought up and married and there I lived and she says still I am neither a Bengali nor a Madrasi nor a Hyderabadi but I am an Indian. So she says that to understand I mean uh, today of course we can talk about uh, you know uh, thinking beyond borders and moving beyond uh, uh, one's own uh, parochial interests and so on but at that point of time when uh, this vision of India and this particular speech that I'm referring to is delivered in 1903 so at that point of time this idea is very important that one has to give up uh, uh, um, uh, narrow thinking and one has to go beyond that to uh, understand the sensibility and to respect other people uh, and their uh, uh, you know the, the, the location uh, from where they uh, they come. How so will this you know help in forming the nation as you say because if she comes from Hyderabad she comes from another you know region and uh, you know then she is confined to it as, as you say how does then one think of the India that she has in mind and how it is important. Uh, again, uh, you know, today, of course, it's uh, it might seem uh, like uh, a cliche when we say that unity in diversity. But mm -hmm. she actually explains this idea, mm -hmm. and she says that it is not as if one has to give up one's identity, and there is going to be this very, very uh, uh, singular, uniform sort of identity uh, that we understand to be Indian. Uh, she, she refutes that totally, and she says that no that you you remain where you are and if you uh, you know hail from a particular region or you have a certain set of beliefs so you, that remains but the idea is that that has to coexist along with many other such beliefs and uh, this is this idea uh, uh, allows uh, Sarojini Naidu in her uh, public address which is why she's obviously very very uh, popular and uh, she's an excellent orator so that that uh, reach is something that allows people to imagine an India where uh, you know today we can sit comfortably and say that we believe in uh, unity and diversity. So uh, she she clarifies how one needs to look beyond borders uh, and no she doesn't stop here in fact she says that it is not only about India you have to move beyond that if you truly want to understand unity harmony and brotherhood you have to move even beyond India to understand the interests of other countries. So. Uh, uh, and uh, tied to this is the notion of patriotism and she says the vision of patriotism and she talks about this in a public address in 1917 and it's an interesting year because by this time her poetry collections have been published and now uh, you know henceforth she's going to be more of uh, you know um, uh, a public speaker and uh, the, the golden threshold the bird of time uh, you know these these are collections that have been published and of course these are collections that are marked by sensuousness and uh, uh, unity harmony oneness the idea of love uh, remains uh, you know a very very uh, strong uh, uh, mark in uh, you know in these collections so uh, in this address uh, you know in Allahabad she says gentlemen what shall I speak to you about today you whose hearts are throbbing with that burning love that is called the love of the country what can a mere poet offer to your strength only the dream of a poet only the prayers of a woman that night after night and morning are offered to that temple of the great Bharat Mata uh, uh, in fact uh, Dr. Prakash this is I very specifically uh, brought this in because um, uh, you know this is as I said keeping in mind a question that was raised earlier regarding uh, the, the, the sensuousness and the possibility of a poetic sensibility and sensuousness in Sarojini Naidu's uh, uh, speeches and her prose writings. I think that is a, a you know, kind of a very, very uh, important factor that we see 
here when she says that you know what can a mere poet offer to your strength only the dreams of a poet only the prayers of a woman so um, she she moves on to say that you know in spring time when the blossoms break open when the bulbuls sing or oh, what is it that comes to a poet as it comes to the heart of you all it is the vision of a life different so even as a public figure her poetic persona does not uh, uh, die her po poetic persona is is not uh, separate from the person that she is in her uh, public address and the speeches uh, that she delivers or her prose writings for that matter so uh, uh, she's she's she is pretty much uh, you know uh, a poet even when she's uh, talking to the people and it is this poetic sensibility that also allows her to sensitively communicate these ideas uh, to to uh, a whole mass of people who are listening to her so uh, what is it that comes to a poet as it comes to the heart of you all it is a vision of a life different and this is the life that the life that she is looking for is the life in a free india and and her constant uh, concern in all her uh, you know prose writings and her speeches is uh, about what is it that is going to make india and hitting at uh, you know colonialism she refutes the fact that the outsiders have come and divided india she says you cannot give uh, that possibility to uh, you know you cannot let that happen because according to her if the heart is free then whoever wants cannot make a slave out of you and she urges people to keep this spirit of freedom uh, you know that can conquer all so patriotism then is the spirit of freedom that will allow people to uh, to kind of um, emerge victorious at the end of it it is this vision of love and humanity so um, uh, with this in mind another speech that she delivers in uh, bihar uh, she talks about the democratic sentiment and speaks about uh, unity and diversity uh, you know something that we were just talking about and she says keep your separate entities keep your separate creed but bring to the federated india the culture of centuries to enrich with all those contributions that each has to make for the sum total for the healthful growth of the national progress so national progress is is something that is a um, it's 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 an idea first of all that she is imagining that she is part of a country sh that she wants should progress secondly what is the nature of this progress and who are going to be the participants in this process of uh, uh, national progress so she speaks about how democracy is being talked about in the west and she says that it's this democratic sentiment she says is something that has been uh, you know uh, part of uh, 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 india it's always been there and this democratic sentiment according to sarojini naidu is very important because it has a certain what she calls the inviolable sense of justice that gives to every man his equal chance in the evolution of national life so uh, she she uh, 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 raises this question about uh, you know uh, the acquisition the 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 realization actually of this democratic sentiment which according to her can only happen through a process of cooperation of unity and this is possible only through an exchange of knowledge knowledge not only within a particular community but knowledge Uh, you know between different uh, groups and uh, this interchange of knowledge and culture is something that uh, uh, she keeps talking about so uh, she says and again uh, you know she says a combination of the visionary the dreamer with the statesman and the soldier the mystic genius with the virility of manhood that is what we want in this great india of ours um like uh, you know in her poetry uh today in the 21st century we might uh, imagine uh, you know the 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 uh, metaphor of the virility of manhood or uh, the the trope of uh, you know the the notion of the bharat math we might uh, question this and say that you know these are uh, uh, traditional views and so on but we have to understand that we are talking about the period of 1903 1917 which is the time period when these are ideas that are churning these are ideas that are in the process of being generated they are in the process of being made so uh, today i mean so many years later uh, you know to look back it is important to restore the sense of historicity to sarojini naidu's poetry and to her speeches her writings 
to understand that she is part of uh, you know this this uh, the, the the whole group that has actually allowed uh, uh, you know uh, india to be shaped in a certain way so uh, the blend of the poetic and the realistic is there and uh, she says she of course talks about the the ganga and the jamuna and she says that you know this is the it's the symbol of the unity of uh, you know two great uh, cultures and uh, here again i would uh, you know request uh, dr prakash to um, <coughs> come in and raise uh, raise a few uh, you know uh, uh, dr pal nagpal uh, you have talked about uh, earlier sensuousness and the sensuousness is the you know character is is the mark you know of a poet so the poet you know looks at the world around him or her uh, from the from the angle of enjoy, enjoyment from the angle of enge engagement right. so uh, i think a poet makes a special kind of a leader uh, in, in in a situation where the uh, nation the country is going towards freedom and uh, well uh, freedom itself is a very sensuous concept mm -hmm. freedom you know uh, sends a kind of current through the, through our bodies to, to you know when, when we can go anywhere we like when we say we can say anything that we like and we can express ourselves in the way that best suited for our you know ideals and all so uh, she understands sensuousness and i uh, thoroughly appreciate your point of view uh, one point that i'd like to uh, you know uh, raise here is the question of democratic sentiment you know democratic idea democratic principle democratic ideals uh, you know but uh, democratic sentiment what exactly uh, is suggested here uh, when she she is actually uh, talking about uh, a what what democracy is all about and be how that can be realized and uh, she talks about two things one how you know uh, in the west this is she looks at it uh, its emergence in the west as a new idea and she says that it's not as if uh, this idea is being kind of imported from there she says this has always been a part of uh, indian history and uh, she cites examples there and makes a case for uh, uh, you know the democratic sentiment which uh, according to her is a sense of justice that democratic sentiment mm. is this idea of coexistence which uh, which tells the human being which tells the individual living in this uh, uh, society that uh, 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 there is uh, every man according to her has this equal chance uh, of progress every single person and for her she says that true genuine democracy is when every single person has that right and access to everything Uh, you know, in uh, in his or her life. In the home situation, what is the democratic sentiment? In the home situation, for her, the democratic sentiment is vis-a-vis -vis the women, mm -hmm. and in fact, uh, that is uh, you know the the next uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, part of this lecture where I want to discuss in detail her uh, 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 concerns regarding women, and um, uh, she talks about two very important factors. One is the education of women. and the other is uh, you know the the whole idea of the franchise so um, to begin with women's education is uh, something that she she uh, starts on very early in 1906 itself the early years when she's uh, started addressing um, you know public gatherings she clearly states uh, she says the success of the whole movement lies in the woman question it's not you but we who are the true nation builders so uh, you know she this this um uh, you and we uh, uh, dialectic that is there is something that she uh, makes very clear she says that you cannot imagine either uh, a free india or a national progress without the women so the education of women is very very significant here and she makes a reference uh, to uh, krupa bai satyanathan and she says that uh, mrs satyanathan's uh, uh, the magazine that uh, krupa bai satyanathan takes out which is called the indian ladies magazine uh, that starts this correspondence on the education of women she refers to that and she says that you know uh, it this discussion on the education of women is very very important and she's there is no sense of doubt she's absolutely clear and uh, she, it is with this clarity that gives her the her speeches that conviction that she is able to spread the message and uh, get this across so she says that um, the the a group of men who are our friends and who understand that uh, you cannot imagine uh, progress without women she says they support this idea at the same time she also talks about a group of men whom she says that do not support this idea and i uh, will just quote from one of her uh, speeches um, she says what then will become of the comfortable domestic ideals as, as exemplified by the luscious halwa and the savory omelet 
So uh, she says uh, she is very very sharply critical of the group that actually says that uh, domestic ideals will be lost if women are to be educated. So uh, she says that basically people are only thinking about their immediate gains uh, within the family where uh, uh, the women are restricted to the kitchen and uh, are not allowed to uh, be educated in any way. So uh, she also talks about uh, a middle group uh, of people who say that okay fine if you have to educate women then uh, teach this and not that. But Sarojini Naidu is very clear and she says in education you cannot say thus far and no further. So uh, uh, this, this, the stress, the emphasis uh, acquires a greater form again when uh, you know uh, at the speech given at a function to celebrate the 50th anniversary of a Gujarati journal called Sri Bodh. Uh, it is a journal devoted to the education of women. She says we must first understand the rationale of the woman question. So uh, you know why is it that uh, why why is she talking about uh, the the education of women and uh, and she also talks about the role that women can play. Once they're educated, what is the role that women can play in the process of nation building? So she makes important points in this regard and um, she says that uh, we should not simply just uh, uh, whisk away this question by referring to what she calls the radiant yesteryears of history. She says we are the children of tomorrow. So uh, uh, Sarojini Naidu is uh, very, very uh, futuristic in her approach. And she says, uh, uh, she talks about the women who have made a mark in the intellectual field. And uh, a very, very, very important point that comes here, which is that um, she says we would be, if we look at uh, the women who had made a mark in, in the intellectual field, who had received education, who had uh, re, uh, acquired a certain stature in life, she says we would be celebrating if, if these women uh, were, uh, had managed to educate further, uh, you know, their, their children and so on. And if this line of education for women had continued in an unbroken manner, she says we would be celebrating a shining chronicle of 20 centuries of national glory and not be celebrating the mere jubilee of a tardy renaissance. She is quick to point out, but it is a renaissance. So she is not pessimistic about it, but she is drawing our attention to the fact that if for centuries what had started earlier, which was the education of women, she says if this process had continued, then today we would be celebrating almost 20 centuries of national glory. So um, uh, this, this renaissance, of course, she says nonetheless it is a renaissance, we have made a beginning. Now this brings to mind, at least to my mind, the work of feminists like Elaine Cho Walter and Gilbert and Gubar who've actually uh, kind of um, try to talk about uh, uh, the, the female tradition in the context of uh, you know, women and women writers of the 19th century. And when we look at Sarojini Naidu's uh, speeches, her writings, we understand uh, this that you know, she's, she's already raised this question because uh, uh, both uh, uh, Show Walter and of course Gilbert and Gubar, they write, they write much later. But in 1906 and 1908, she's already raised this question about an unbroken line of uh, education that should have been provided to women and uh, so th this is uh, truly uh, you know the, the the meaning the nuance of the word uh, renaissance is something that one really understands here and uh, 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 you know this this is, uh, takes us to the next point which is uh, a distinction that she makes between education and instruction so uh, in in, a, in an earlier speech she had said instruction she says is merely the accumulation of knowledge and uh, education, she says, is the immeasurable, the beautiful, indispensable atmosphere in which we live, move and have our being. So education is something to be enjoyed. It is not some kind of accumulation of bookish knowledge that is going to um, uh, fetch something in life or be going to translate into something. But it is just, uh, education is about uh, free existence. It's about uh, enjoying this uh, life. So, um, which, which is immeasurable, beautiful and, and in, it is in an indispensable atmosphere. And that's what leads her to say, you know, that the hand that rocks the cradle rules the world. <laughs> I can see the energy. <laughs> Thank you.
uh, welcome viewers to this discussion on uh, Sarojini Naidu's prose works and um, especially her views on the education of women in India. Uh, the Sarojini Naidu makes a very clear distinction between instruction and education, uh, uh, looking at instruction only as a mere accumulation of knowledge and she says even though of course you require that, but education is something that is to be truly enjoyed. So she says that acquisition of bookish knowledge is a vital part of education, but what is important is the liberal and priceless culture that comes from life and from a discussion, travel and intercourse she says with diverse minds. And uh, she says the, the crowning triumph of education, she says, is if we are to really realize that, will be the complete emancipation of women. Related to this uh, idea of uh, education for women uh, is another uh, uh, pressing concern in the early 20th century, which is of women and the franchise. And, uh, you know, there is a resolution on the women's franchise. Uh, that is passed and uh, she discusses this in uh, in her speech in Bijapur in 1918. Uh, the uh, women of Bombay had uh, put in a requisition to the Bombay Provincial Conference that the word uh, man should include to mean politically both man and woman regarding matters of citizenship. Now uh, to this uh, the question that was raised was will the men of India really speaking agree to uh, something of this sort. So. Uh, she initially believes that appealing to men's, uh, appealing to tradition and appealing to men's sense of chivalry, uh, uh, she says that uh, they will certainly not oppose it. However, in Calcutta what happens is that a half-hearted resolution was drawn up and it was decided that, uh, uh, you know, there will be some sort of partial uh, franchise that will be given to women. And this is something that disturbs uh, Sarojini Naidu and she immediately says, uh, she rectifies this and she says that, uh, so they, they withdraw the resolution. She says that there will be no appeal to anybody's uh, chivalry. She says we, women of India should appeal not to the chivalry of men but to the sense of justice. And this again uh, brings in uh, you know uh, 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 what uh, we were discussing about the democratic sentiment and especially in the context of women. So uh, the question is whether in the reconstruction of, natural, uh, of the national life it will be possible for you to have a rich national life unless and until it is shared and supported by women who are the soul of citizenship and the life of the nation. And she's doing something very interesting here. She's uh, not breaking the uh, stereotype of the uh, woman as uh, uh, lending the spiritual uh, to the family or to the society or to the world. She, she keeps that uh, role and she says that because of that, there is no possibility of a rich national life unless this national life is politically in terms of citizenship shared and supported by women who are the soul of uh, you know citizenship and they are the life of the nation. So uh, she talks about how this political and spiritual unity has been there in ancient India and she also acknowledges how uh, women's right is now what she calls slumbering and uh, these need to be revived. And uh, she, she raises an important question where she says that what is the logic of refusal to say women like Pandita Ramabai, Swarna Kumari Ghoshal, Kamla Satyanadan, Kamini Sen, Shirin Bai uh, Kasadji, uh, Nagwa Joshi, Anasuya Sarabai, Abola Bose, Cornelia Sorabji, Indira Devi, Sarla Devi, Faiji Patel, Uma Nehru, uh, Vidya Raman Bai, Chandrasekhar Ayer or Sadashiv Ayer. Now in documenting all these names in, in kind of uh, uh, putting together all these names. What we have in front of us and especially you know uh, going back to the earlier question of um, this unbroken line of uh, uh, you know uh, women uh, who are educated which is very very desirable is not there but is desirable. It should have been like that. So uh, she links it to the franchise when she says that you know why should these women be denied the franchise and they have all contributed to national life. So uh, this speech to at least to my mind seems almost like a feminist manifesto of sorts that puts together, that brings together important issues and uh, puts together important names and uh, again uh, going back to the point that uh, you know um, uh, uh, the uh, critics uh, 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 from the west have of course done this much later and uh, Sarojini Naidu in the context of India in kind of putting all these names together in one place has already given to us uh, the, the immediate 
uh, context uh, where these women have been very, very active participants and contributors in the national life. And um, uh, uh, I, uh, Dr. Prakash, I hear I'd uh, like to just uh, uh, get your views on what you think uh, about, uh, you know, Saroji Naidu's uh, speech, especially in the context of, uh, you know, the women and the franchise being a sort of manifesto for uh, women even today. Actually, your description of uh, the place of women in society, according to her, is really very eloquent. I must say that, you know, the way uh, different words have been used to emphasize the cause of women and their role in society is remarkable. I particularly noticed, you know, when you were talking about education is instruction and more. This is what you are suggesting. So education is not merely, you know, getting uh, different facts and then putting them together and then you answer back on that basis the question that, that, that one is posed to. And, uh, you know, uh, edu education actually is not instruction, but it's knowledge. <coughs> this is what you're saying. Then women in franchise, you know, without giving them the voting rights, without giving them the right to, you know, take part in politics, uh, you, you uh, mo most of the, you know, uh, job is supposed to be then lip service to the women's cause. But if you give them voting rights, then of course, you are contributing a lot. Right. Chivalry and, uh, uh, not chivalry, but justice, nice. Uh, you also talk about, uh, you know, a, a women being the soul of citizenship and the life of the nation. Yes. The, this is not merely poetic, you know, kind of emphasis, but, but uh, something that she really means to mm. be the case. And then fem manifesto for this. This is remarkable. I don't think even today, uh, when fem feminists uh, come forward, they talk about a manifesto. But she is a political leader. Yes. She is a visionary. Mm. She is also a poet. And she knows that unless there is a manifesto, mm. uh, there, there is a kind of statement, a declaration, you know, women cannot succeed in the in, in the aim that they have set for themselves. Yes. So I really admire and appreciate uh, the points that you have made, and uh, I think uh, uh, you could uh, go ahead with your discussion uh, with, with these things. Uh, one point I could raise regarding uh, you know uh, justice, so far as women are concerned, what exactly is meant? Uh, I think here again, uh, Sarojini Naidu is looking at justice in the sense of equal rights. The fact that if if you uh, if the men and this is something she says that you know women should no longer appeal uh, to the chivalric sentiment of men. Instead, uh, uh, they should appeal to their sense of justice. That if men uh, take pride in being just, in being democratic, in in leading the nation, then the true sense of justice is one where women share. Uh, equally and women have equal rights and they are also educated and uh, uh, they are able to move forward otherwise uh, you know this this dream of a of a nation that is going to progress is going to be uh, an incomplete sort of uh, an idea so um, uh, with this we also move on to another important aspect and you know and has already discussed uh, address to the youth and she also goes on later to explain the, the notion of uh, uh, Satyagraha. So um, and uh, you know after, in 1919 after the Rollet Act is uh, passed, uh, uh, she defends, she goes on to defend Mahatma Gandhi's call for fast and uh, after the massacre at the Jallianwala Bagh, uh, she displays tremendous courage uh, in a speech that is delivered in London in 1920 at Kingsway Hall. And in it, she speaks, uh, she very clearly begins her speech by saying that she is not addressing her compatriots here, but to Englishmen and Englishwomen. And she specially speaks of the atrocities that are committed on the women and asks, and this is a question uh, that she asks uh, the English people. And uh, uh, please mark that this is a speech that is delivered in London at Kingsway Hall. It's, she's not sitting back in India and saying this. So she goes right there and she asks them, uh, would you hold, and um, I quote from her speech, would you hold your empire by a dishonor on the womanhood of another race? Or would you rather lose your empire out of chivalry for the honor and chastity for, of another nation? What shall it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What is your place today among the honorable nations of a free world? No nation that rules by tyranny is free. It is a slave of its own despotism. So uh, I think these are absolutely great ideas that she, are, she is putting forth in, the, these, in these lines. And uh, it's a very well thought of, a very balanced point of view that she gives. And she, you know, she, in, in this speech, she actually goes on to describe the kind of atrocities that were committed against women in the Jallianwala Bagh uh, massacre. And she says that, you know, does it befit a nation 
to actually behave in this way? Would you rather be, and of course she appeals to the chivalric sense of the, of the nation, but she also says that, you know, uh, 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 what about your soul? Are you going to be able to deal with this? And uh, I think uh, the most hard hitting of this is the statement that what is your place today among the honorable nations of a free world? That if you talk about a genuine, uh, you know, free, a genuinely free world, then this kind of an act is something that uh, cannot be accepted and has to, uh, you know, um, uh, be absolutely done away with. So uh, uh, she uh, here again she she de brings in, um, you know, in in another speech she brings in uh, the reference to Mahatma Gandhi and she says that you know he's the voice of change. And uh, she tells the youth that, you know, he's the flute of Sri Krishna that is within your own hearts. And uh, she talks about sacrifice, that you have to sacrifice. And she, she talks about the role, just as she talks about the women, education and the youth. She ta also talks about the kind of sacrifice that the youth should make. So she says that it is important now at this juncture, and uh, this is uh, the 1920s, it is important at this juncture uh, for uh, the youth to join the struggle, turn its back upon colleges, deny oneself the right to learn. She says, this is a right that everybody has, which is a right to learn. She says, but uh, you know, you have come to a time now where you have to sacrifice this right to learn so that you can acquire freedom. And freedom, freedom she says, is worthy, uh, you know, of uh, uh, this kind of sacrifice that needs to be made. So, and she appeals to this the sense of uh, you know humanity in the youth a deep seated sense of humanity in the youth and says that you have to pledge yourselves to yourself that it, it's a promise that you make to yourself that you are going to uh, uh, give up give up all and join the struggle for freedom she also dwells on the importance of khadi uh, you know for the for the youth and uh, uh, in, in this sense she visualizes the future uh, very importantly in, in, in an essay that she's written, it's called The Soul of India. It was written in 1921. She says, old ideals are born again in a myriad-hearted multiform energy and shine afresh in the revival of her national learning, in the renewal of her national arts, in the restoration of her manifold spiritual activities. So we, we see uh, this woman who is, who is a poet, who, is, who has the ability to reach out to people, who also has the strength and the courage to go there in, in the realm of the colonizer itself and to, you know, in London, in the, in the hall to actually uh, uh, absolutely condemn uh, the, the uh, you know, uh, massacre of people. So, um, uh, and to do it in a very, very, to argue it out, do it in a very balanced sort of manner, so that the point reaches people and um, this is where uh, you know taking the argument further her uh, uh, contribution in terms of evolving what she calls a kind of four point program in a speech at uh, Trichur where she says that Khadar is not merely weaving and spinning cotton Khadar is a movement of the mind as well as the spinning wheel so uh, uh, Khadar I would like is, to raise here you know, uh, one or two questions for instance, uh, you have emphasized now the uh, you know importance of uh, a woman uh, in the field of politics, and so now she is graduating, let's say, from social thought, from culture, from from, from sensuousness to uh, and from poetry to politics, and uh, it's a hard-boiled politics, and it's the politics you know which is going to give answer to imperialism. Mm. So this is one part, and it's a it's a new development in her career, and she is playing that role which she has not played earlier. Mm. Then you know uh, you talk about internationalism. Mm. She's not a nationalist in the sense you know that there, there might be some uh, die-hard nationalist at that time. She's not talking only about India. Mm. She's yeah. also talking about the world. Mm. So these two points you know uh, you know take her on a different scale, mm. and she becomes you know almost as 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 great you know um, uh, she's inspired by Gandhiji, but the way he's handling politics, she's doing the same. Yes. So this is where you know uh, you you might you know. Uh, uh, Comment on this also? Yes, uh, and this is where I, I don't know whether it's it's on it's a, the process of evolution. I think continues in uh, Sarojini Naidu at the level of uh, you know uh, her being a poet as well as uh, her being uh, you know a public figure. Uh, the the important idea here, especially uh, you know with reference to uh, Gandhiji, is that. Uh, she's constantly explaining these ideas and which is where I said that you know she's the voice of change and in that sense an organic intellectual because she's constantly reaching out to people and, and 
bringing out uh, you know the the uh, uh, the ideas that are required for the realization of this sort of change and a change of such great magnitude. So, um, which is where this uh, four point program that she talks about, she talks about as I said, this khadi is a signifier not of cloth, not only of the spinning wheel, but of the churning of ideas of the mind is very significant. Again, uh, the second point for her is the idea of national education, where of course women are foremost as far as Sarojini Naidu is concerned. She thinks about Swaraj for all, uh, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, 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 person who is well placed in this life or the person who is totally at the bottom of the social ladder in terms of caste or any other manner, all the categories have to, the, if, if there has to be Swaraj, it has to be for every single person of India, irrespective of any kind of categorization. She uh, appeals to uh, people to think about unity and how unity is an important factor in the realization of India as a nation. And when she talks about this, she gives the example of the king of Cochin, who she says gave to the Jews equal rights and, uh, you know, equal rights in the sense of trade, where, you know, the, the, uh, the, uh, whoever was settled in Cochin had certain rights for trade. And when uh, these people landed on the shore, they were also given equal rights for trade. So she appeals to the people of Trichur in that sense to spread this message of harmony. But you know, uh, of unity, not of difference, of fellowship, but not of division of uh, creeds and communities. And focus together, she says, by a common purpose, a common understanding, a common sacrifice and a common love. So uh, we were, we were uh, you know, uh, uh, also talking about uh, her participation in politics at two levels and this is of course at the national level and she's also at the international level, as I said in her speech in London, she's she condemns the Jallianwala Bagh massacre. Now, an, another speech at Durban Hall in 1924, she talks about her visit to South Africa and how she's given lots of gifts there. She likens the place to almost a Garden of Eden, but then mentions how she's so depressed to see that so many people over there are oppressed. She speaks for the people uh, in, in Durban Hall. She speaks for the people who are born in India or the children, grandchildren of indentured labourers who come to this soil, people from India who moved as indentured labourers to uh, South Africa and live like pariahs and lepers of humanity in your midst. Why is the hand of the white man up against the coloured races in this country? What have my people done to you? People, she, she says that, you know, these are people who did not come as rivals, you know, they didn't come to trade. They came here, they were poor, they were uneducated people and they came with hope and promise. And she points out how the indentured labourers were, uh, you know, they, they came uneducated and could only make thumb impressions. But they made thumb impressions on documents that made them slaves to the whites. But she is very quick to point out and she says that they came uneducated but not uncultured. So, uh, I think here, you know, when we talk about uh, some of her uh, speeches being, uh, you know, functioning like uh, a feminist manifesto, here we see how she's also, you know, fighting uh, against this issue of colour, of this, this issue of race and she's, she's concerned about the generations of Indians who are living in uh, South Africa and facing these problems. So, she asks the people as to what they are doing to overcome these issues to create a new heaven and earth. And uh, uh, she presents, uh, you know, a lot of details uh, of uh, a settlement that was signed with uh, General Smuts and she says that that gave a special place to the Indians to be treated fairly. But this whittling away of this is something that is uh, severely criticized by uh, Sarojini Naidu. So, uh, in fact, her speeches in that sense are the finest example of uh, today. We talk about a lot of uh, theories, uh, you know, and we talk about uh, feminism and we talk about postcolonialism. I think it is the, 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 the uh, proper manifestos in the context of uh, Indian literary theory can actually be seen in the germ of it can be seen in the speeches of uh, Sir Ojini Naidu. So, she, she appeals to all to build in South Africa the traditions of liberty, equality and justice and she also, she not only appeals to the British to their idea of, uh, to their idea of, uh, you know, uh, justice, but she also appeals to this notion of uh, Christianity. Um, uh, with this, we uh, arrive at a phase uh, where um, uh, Sarojini Naidu uh, delivers uh, a speech in 1947 
uh, which is in March 1947, just before uh, you know uh, India has to gain independence, and uh, it is after Jawaharlal Nehru's speech that she uh, speaks at what is called the Asian Relations Conference, and she puts the task ahead for uh, an awakening India, for the renaissance of India. And she says, you know, what are we to do? Uh, should we arm ourselves for battles and so on? She says, no, we have to refashion armory in accordance with ancient ideals as soldiers of peace and missionaries of love. So this idea of peace, harmony, unity, brotherhood, these are ideas that, that she clings to right to the end. There is this, this, this consistency in the realization of, uh, you know, uh, a free India is, is, is there in Sarojini Naidu. And it was at this uh, conference that she, uh, because this was an Asian relations conference, she talks about other countries like China, Egypt, Mongolia, Afghanistan, Persia and so on. And she says that the diversity of the Asian culture has cemented people. Right, so um, here too, you know, in, within India, she says that, you know, uh, she, it's not as one is expected to uh, kind of give up um, uh, one's uh, set of beliefs or, um, uh, you know, the, the way one lives but to coexist, to accept and to remain in unity. And she suggests this also at the international level because the question that she then asks is who wants a colourless culture? So uh, she says nobody wants that and it, it is this, this that adds colour, uh, you know, to, to life. And um, uh, so here too, uh, maybe uh, one or two uh, quick uh, comments uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Prakash, especially regarding uh, the idea of, uh, of uh, you know, Saroji Naidu's uh, struggle against uh, racism, so to say. I think it's a <coughs> very comprehensive uh, analysis of uh, the person's role, the person's thinking, the person's evolution, you know, in, in Indian conditions. And uh, I'm particularly struck by the, the last point that you made, uh, that is with respect to, you know, ordinary masses, people, you know, who left their home and hearth, went elsewhere, mm -hmm. and who became victims of a new kind of exploitation there. Not that they were very happy here, yeah. otherwise they wouldn't have gone from here. Mm -hmm. But then when we go there, then it, another kind of cruelty uh, and insensitivity mm -hmm. awaits them. So, and she's fighting for them. Mm -hmm. So, in a way, in India also, she's not fighting against the privileged, uh, fighting for the privileged. She, she's fighting for the poor. And when it comes to the poor and the helpless elsewhere, and uh, the, the point that you raised regarding education among women, that is, I think, the finest point with respect mm -hmm. to her. And uh, that has not been achieved even today. Yes. So that way, I think, uh, it's, it's a wonderful thing that you have said. Mm -hmm. And yes. uh, you might... And again here, uh, you know, when we look at uh, her remarks at this Asian Relations Conference, she says, therefore we are, and uh, I quote from her speech, therefore we are at the first springtime of the world when the birds sing when the waters smile at the first sight of the sun, when flowers blossom and young brides put flowers on their hair. I bid you arise from your grave and say, there is no death, there shall be no death for those who move onward, united in a spirit of hope and courage. And it is, it is with this that, you know, she functions as said, both at the national and at the international level. So taking people with her. This so, and, and here what we also realize is this, that she performs a great role in her in constantly reaching out to people and uh, and what a contribution that she has made in cementing people in spreading these ideas of unity and harmony ideas that we live by even today and uh, i think uh, uh, the, the, her role uh, in kind of you know uh, she helping shape uh, a free india uh, and india as a nation uh, with us uh, with certain ideals is uh, something that really uh, uh, demands uh, praise and recognition. And with this, uh, I, I will end uh, by just uh, citing a few lines uh, from a poem that she has uh, written. It's called uh, To India. And uh, the last stanza of this poem says, uh, Thy future calls thee with a manifold sound to crescent honours, splendours, victories vast. Waken, O slumbering mother, and be crowned, who once were empress of the sovereign past. So uh, uh, I think this, this uh, movement towards the future, the idea that she says that we are children of tomorrow and uh, 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 constantly, her constant engagement with the future and how India is to be shaped there with a very, very uh, strong thrust on the education of women and, uh, you know, the idea of uh, uh, franchise for all women, the right to vote for all women is something uh, uh, very, very precious and I think uh, especially uh, as uh, 
uh, citizens today, we, we recognize the kind of valuable contribution that Sarojini Naidu has uh, made uh, in this direction. With this, uh, this lecture comes to an end. Thank you. Well, friends, uh, we have had a scintillating <coughs> lecture and discussion uh, from Dr. Payal Nagpal. And uh, the, the way, you know, uh, it has ended, the way it has concluded, uh, you know, uh, it, with the statement, for instance, that we are children of tomorrow. In fact, I was uh, wondering as to what exactly this would mean uh, in the context of uh, the poet that we are discussing. But then, as Rosie Naidu, uh, very aptly, uh, you know, f I gave the phrase children of tomorrow, which means producing uh, tomorrow, which means that tomorrow is today and that we are its children and tomorrow will grow, grow up. So there are many, you know, uh, implications of the phrase and being a poet, she knows how to use language. And uh, well, um, <coughs> uh, Dr. Payal Nagpal uh, has done, uh, you know, uh, a great, very comprehensive job telling us about the, you know, oeuvre of, of the political writing that uh, she, she gave us. The ideas that, that she uh, threw in front of people for, for them to consider. She is not a preacher. She is not telling us all that we should do. She is telling us uh, to grapple with the question. And this is the essence. This is the, what, the, uh, what, what Payal Nagpal has called the soul of uh, literature. And uh, this is, I think, the quality that the viewers, all of us, can also emulate in our life You know, with the, with the inspiration that we receive from uh, uh, Sarojini Naidu. Uh, with these words, I, I thank Dr. Nagpal for giving us this kind of a lecture. Thank and you. And thanks to yours. <coughs> thank you.